Warning, the following message may be offensive to some audiences. These audiences may include but are not limited to professing Christians who never read their Bible, sissies, sodomites, men with man buns, those who approve of men with man buns, man bun enablers, white knights for men with man buns, homemakers who have finished Netflix but don't know how to meal plan, and people who refer to their pets as fur babies. Your discretion is advised. People are tired of hearing nothing but doom and despair on the radio. The message of Christianity is that salvation is found in Christ alone, and any who reject Christ therefore forfeit any hope of salvation, any hope of heaven. The issue is that humanity is in sin, and the wrath of Almighty God is hanging over our heads. They will hear his words, they will not act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment, when the fires of wrath come, they will be consumed and they will perish. God wrapped himself in flesh, condescended, and became a man, died on the cross for sin, was resurrected on the third day, has ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he sits now to make intercession for us. Jesus is saying there is a group of people who will hear his words, they will act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment come in that final day, their house will stand. stand, stand, stand. Welcome to Bible Bash, where we aim to equip the saints for the works of ministry by answering the questions you're not allowed to ask. We're your hosts, Harrison Kerrigan, and Pastor Tim Mullet, and today we'll answer the age-old question, are youth pastors real pastors? And before we get into the meat of this episode, I just wanted to ask you guys to go ahead and leave a like uh, on this video and leave a comment as well, as that really helps us fight against uh, the Christian hating YouTube algorithm. So go ahead and do that. And that's one way you can support us. And, you know, now as we're looking forward to this, you know, topic, this question that we're going to talk through, Tim, do you have any Bible verses that relate to to youth pastors? Are there any Bible verses about youth pastors? <laughs> I, I don't know of any Bible verses about youth pastors, but I mean, certainly there's a, there's Bible verses about pastors in general. Uh, one of those could be first Timothy three, one, uh, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he, despi- he, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, uh, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the God's church? Uh, he must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be thought of well, well by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. So that's a good passage to think about. So that's obviously talking about pastors in general. I noticed the distinct lack of of you know the title youth pastor in that. Yeah, I mean it's one of those Bible mysterious verse. things that. Um, you know, we have all sorts of pastors. So we have, uh, you know, worship pastors. We have female pastors at times, depending on <laughs> what female some, quote unquote pastors. pastors. Yeah. 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 So we have, you know, worship pastors, uh, uh, female pastors. We have, you know, jail, you, jail ministry pastors. Yeah, we all, You've got, you know, uh, sharing the gospel pastors yeah. or uh, great, great commission pastors. Outreach pastors, yeah. Outreach pastors. We have all kinds of pastors, yeah. Uh, but then it, it's amazing that as you read the Bible, you don't really see any of these adjectives put on these things. So that's troubling for sure. Yeah, it's pretty much just, you know, there's a pot, there's, you know, the 12 apostles and then there was pastors and, you know, overseers or uh, shepherds and then deacons. Yeah. And that's, a, that's about all I can, all I can think of am i forgetting anything i mean you know that's that's about it but <laughs> <laughs> that's at least the majority of it so so there's obviously no bible verses that mention youth pastors but then we're you know so we're asking the question are youth pastors real pastors well if we're basing the answer solely off of are there any bible verses that say you know youth pastors you know, this is to you or something like that, or obey your youth pastors. Right. If there's no Bible verses like that, then what are we, you know, how do we figure out, you know, is a title like this actually biblical or not? <laughs> obey your youth pastors in the Lord for they are keeping watch over uh, your Frisbee and we'll give an account. <laughs> <laughs> for your Frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I don't it? remember reading that. One. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I uh, put all these uh, verses that I want to make up in uh, thir- my, 
you know, my favorite book of the Bible, Third Timothy. Um, so. <laughs> Third Timothy. <laughs> You have to let me know when it drops. <laughs> when it drops. <laughs> unreleased, previously unreleased. Um, no, I mean, it's one of those things where in the standard, I mean, I, I think, you know, your standard American church, it's um, it's certainly weird. I mean, so youth pastors, the idea of a youth pastor is weird in different directions. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons why it's weird is in, I would say in most American churches, probably the idea of a youth pastor is basically just an adult friend you know, slightly older adult friend to young kids who you know, maybe just like barely more spiritually mature than them. And, and so he, he operates as kind of a go between between the children and their parents in that kind of way. And his job is primarily to entertain them and to keep them occupied and, you know, maybe at best, you know, be there to talk to them about whatever spiritual concerns they might have because they wouldn't want to talk to someone who's like actually old and mature and godly in any way. <laughs> and so, I mean, typically that's like the, the idea of a youth pastor is just um, someone maybe who aspires to be a pastor one day and, you know, he's just given the grunt work of taking care of the kids, so to speak. So the young people. And most of that, I mean, I don't know, most of that probably involves, you know, vast majority of his, you know, time involves trying to play silly games and entertain them. And, and then maybe he'll throw a five minute devotional in there, um, too, you know, so I, I mean, I, I'm sure that I mean, there's obviously a spectrum where there's quote unquote youth pastors who are more serious than all that, you know, but then I, I would say that that isn't too much of a caricature of what we're talking about. So for Many, if not most, youth pastors, you are probably talking about someone whose primary qualifications for the job is um, their ability to throw a frisbee or come up with <laughs> goofy games or something like that. Uh, you know, they're probably loud personality and you know that kind of thing. So they're entertaining to that demographic in that way. Um, so, you know, part part of the problem is what's actually happening like with most youth, youth pastors in that they're less of a pastor and more of a game player or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, the other part of the problem, and this is, you know, probably I would, I would think more of, well, I don't know if it's more significant, but it's uh, certainly a problem, uh, a different kind of problem for, for sure. But uh, the problem is that like, when you think about this word pastor, word pastor actually has a meaning. And one of the things that, you know, particularly Southern Baptist churches do is that they have a great capacity to invent new positions that are not in the Bible. And then if you invent these new positions, then the problem is that after you've invented this position that doesn't exist, then it is a way of handing off the responsibilities that that position has. So like a pastor has certain like biblical roles and requirements in the Bible and expectations. And then not only that, a pastor has qualifications. So we read the qualifications for you know, someone who has the office of overseer or pastor or elder in the Bible. And then if you're going to create a new position called a youth pastor, then functionally the move that many churches are making is that they put someone in that position who doesn't meet like the basic qualifications of a pastor. So mm -hmm. they don't, I mean, typically, I mean, most American churches, they don't really want, they don't consider their youth pastor to be a pastor pastor, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no one, yeah. no uh -huh. one, no one thinks about him that way. I mean, like, you, you know, the vast majority of adults wouldn't want to go to the youth pastor to get pastoral care or something like right. that. Right. Yeah. Or like if, if the youth pastor was preaching on Sunday to, ev you know, to everyone right. that would, it would feel probably for the adults, at least it would feel more like a, oh, it's kid time. huh? Yeah. This would be a downgrade. You know, I, I, I don't even think in most churches that would ever happen, you know, be, and, and then, you know, certainly they, they wouldn't put this youth pastor on an elder board, right. Uh, as an equal decision maker, you know, within the church in that way. So whatever a youth pastor is in the minds of many people, it's almost like a, you know, B tier pastor or something like that, that isn't quite a pastor. You don't want to give them all the roles and responsibilities of a pastor, but he's just, he's good enough to entertain the kids for the most part. Um, so it's right. that kind of thing. And, and once it gets to that level, um, you are, you're doing something pretty dangerous there, I think. So what, you know, I mean, what is the, like, where is this role coming from? I mean, I know you talked about like, hey, we try to invent these these new things, but how did we get to a place where we have this role that is being given the name 
pastor. So the office is including the name, you know, the title pastor, but then it's not viewed like a pastor would be viewed. Yeah. I mean, part of, part of the problem is that, you know, it's, I mean, you have a lot of um, influence in, in the church to do this kind of thing. And so, you know, in a lot of your big churches, you have a church culture that expects that you have certain ministries, like ministries are being redefined. Um, it, like they're not ministries in the biblical sense of like what, a, what ministry actually is, but ministries like in big church culture are just, you know, events essentially, right? Events that are tailored to minister towards particular demographics, right? So, you know, in your standard big church, you're going to have like every age, every stage, right? So, um, you know, you're going to have preschool ministry. You're going to have, you know, school age ministry. I mean, you'll have middle school, you know, ministry, you have your middle school, you know, classes, you'll have your high school classes. Uh, and then, you know, maybe your college and young adult classes or something like that. And then, you know, then you'll have your men's ministry and then you have your women's ministry. But then basically like ministry in that way is, is a term that's being hijacked. And then you're using that term to basically divide the church up by demographics, right? So you, you need <laughs> yeah. like every demographic that you can think of, really, there's going to be churches out there that are going to se- you know, segregate the church body up in that way. And, and so basically you have like church, you know, church, which for the most part, I mean, for the most part, you know, most people are going to go to that unless you have some kind of abomination called children's church or something like that. But uh, mm-hmm. most of your people are going to go to church together, you know, big church together. Uh, but then, um, you know, through all the other, you know, ways in which the church ministers to the body you know, this is going to be found in like these events or these programs and, you know, these initiatives that are most often you know, segregated on the basis of age um, or gender or something along those lines. And so when you do that, then you need people to run these things, basically. Um, so once you once you have the expectation that the church body needs to be separated out so that everyone can be around people who are like them, um, you know, a lot of that's modeled after just the public school system and that kind of thing and in, in, in those kind of ways. And so, I mean, there's problems at almost every single end uh, where everyone thinks of themselves as a consumer that is going to church that needs to have their, they need to be surrounded by people just like them and then sheltered from people who are different than them because that would be awkward and they wouldn't have any common ground with them. And then, so you have to create, you know, uh, events for them and create, you know, quote unquote, ministries for them. And then, you know, the result of that is going to be the eventually you're going to create this position, this made up position called a youth pastor or something along those lines <laughs> in order to manage like these expectations that are found nowhere in the Bible whatsoever. <laughs> so why, so why then are the, uh, I mean, we could, you know, I could probably ask a lot more questions about the whole creating different, you know, uh, demographic groups within the church that, you know, is introducing this part, you know, is introducing a lot of problems. And in particular, the, you know, we're talking about the youth pastor problem that it creates right now. So I'm sure there's a whole lot of questions I, I could ask about that, but I think right now, you know, I'll stay on the topic of youth pastors specifically. And, um, you know, so it's one thing to say, Hey, you know, we're a big church. We have a lot of different demographic groups and we need people to run those demographic groups. Right. That That's one thing to say, right. but then it's an, it's another thing altogether to say, Hey, I'm going to find, I'm going to, I need a pastor to run this specific, um, you know, group within the subgroup of the church. Um, but I'm not going to hold them to the same standards that I would hold, a regular pastor now is anyone saying that out loud no no one's no pastor is going to say out loud um at least no pastor that i've i've ever heard of is going to say out loud oh yeah we have a youth pastor and they don't meet the actual pastoral qualifications given in the bible but we just made him a pastor anyway no one no one's saying that you know so so the problem's not being admitted to but then at the same time, everyone knows it's a problem because, I mean, you can go on YouTube and look up videos from people who, you know, are making fun of, you know, you, the youth pastor stereotype, basically. And a lot of it is this sort of like, hey, I'm, 
you know, I'm just like you, like, I'm, you know, I'm just like you kids. Um, you know, I, I'm maybe I'm, maybe I'm just freshly married or maybe I'm not even married at all. I understand all of your, all of your, uh, slang dialect. The, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I do all the things that you do. I'm interested in all the things that you do and this and that. And yeah, the, you know, the entertainment stuff is a big kind of joke within the Christian community. Um, so, so why is it then that, you know, even though pastors aren't going to admit that they are lowering the standards, oftentimes they are actually lower, lowering the standards. And I don't know if they don't realize they are, if they just don't think carefully enough about it, or if they just simply don't care about it. But why is it that the standards are being lowered for this one specific position when you might have, you know, like a, I mean, we were joking about the, um, uh, the, what do, what do we call it? The great commission pastor or the, um, <laughs> the outreach, outreach pastor, pastor yeah. you know, the, the jail ministry pastor, what, whatever it is, you know, I think it's a lot less likely that a church would lower the standards for those positions, uh, um, than they would, you know, for the youth pastor one, it seems a lot more likely they would lower the standards for the youth pastor one. So why is it specifically youth pastors that, um, seem to get that sort of treatment? I mean, uh, it's funny. I, I, uh, I'm aware of a situation where, um, I know of a youth pastor who, when I was going to seminary, when I was in seminary and when I was in Bible college, and this has been, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever it's been at this point, but um, he, he was in a youth pastor role, and then he's been in that role. I mean, it's kind of funny. He's been in that role the whole time since I've, you know, been in seminary, Bible college, doing the same things. And you, you see pictures of him on social media right now, and he's still dressed up as the youth pastor. It's like he hasn't, yeah. he hasn't grown up or something like that. Like he's just, he's still wearing the youth pastor costume, trying to be relevant. And it's like, when are you going to age out of this? <laughs> the costume. <laughs> when are you going to age out of this? You know, grow up and get more mature or something. But, uh, you know, it, it is that kind of thing. But, you know, I think related to the question you're asking, you know, why are the expectations that way? I don't think that the vast majority of churches are even remotely thinking about anything the Bible has to say about church structure or things along these lines anyways. Uh, you know, so, I mean, for the vast majority of churches, it's, it's pure pragmatism all the way down. Uh, so, I mean, they're not really governed by the concern, what does the Bible say and how can we do it, that? I mean, as I've talked to pastors along these lines, I mean, like it's in their minds this is an inappropriate question to even be asking. Like, what does the Bible say about how we should, about like pastoral issues like that? Like basically it just, it reduces to the Bible doesn't, is not sufficient. And we need to just be creative and try to reach people. However, we need to try to reach people. And it's not meant to give us like guardrails as to how we do ministry in general. So they're not even asking those kind of questions. And I mean, I, I wish that I was being, hyperbolic or, or something along those lines but that's just how it works i mean they just they're not thinking about like church government issues you know from the standpoint of let's go to the bible and look and see what they say because it has everything we need in order to know how to honor god with these things i mean that's just not what they're doing they're just they're they're their motive you know and and i'm i'm not saying that in a way to like slander people when I, I'm saying that because these are the actual real conversations I've had with church leaders in denominational settings about these kind of topics. And if I'm, the, if I'm the individual who is looking at them and saying, Hey, don't we need to do what the Bible says here and make sure that we're, what we're doing is biblical. They look at you as if you're saying something crazy. It's just like, yeah, well, of course the Bible doesn't you know tell us how to run a church. <laughs> well, and you and you've even dealt with that some. I mean, like an on an anecdotal. Oh yes, yes. You know, I'm not. Like, like we, you know, you you've had things where, hey, we're we're presenting our church bylaws, you know, to a certain um, denominational group, and they, you know, and there's aspects that they disagree with that you point out, like, hey, this is just quoting a Bible verse, right? You know, this is just mimicking the language of the Bible. Here's the, here are the references that we're mim we're trying to mimic in terms of the leadership structure of our church, and you know their response to that is essentially like 
disgust and rejection. Right, right, because the Bible, you know, is not sufficient. It doesn't, I mean, and they'll even go so far as to say it's, you know, it's, they'll make the, you know, dumb arguments. The Bible is not a science textbook or something like that. So why do you expect it to tell you how a church should be run or something like that? <laughs> I mean, in their mind, I mean, like all the Bible is good for is just to tell you how to be saved and then everything else is just up in the air, man. So, I mean, I, I think with these kind of issues, they're not even really thinking about it along the lines of what does the Bible say on these issues. They just, you know, a lot of it's just cultural, you know, so they have their senior leadership team at their church and, you know, that runs things. It's, it's purely pragmatic in that way. I mean, they're not thinking about like the Bible has elders who have qualifications. They're thinking about you know, vast majority of American churches are thinking Hey, we need to have a you know a senior pastor, or a solo senior pastor, and then you know the, either the deacons are running it, running the church, or committees are running the church, or whatever. I mean, what whatever is happening there at that point, they're not even thinking about it as like they need to get a plurality of elders. And the word pastor is just basically just an adjective they put on different you know specialized ministry demographics here. And then if you ask them why are they doing that, it's just like. They, they, they can't even comprehend that they need to give a justification for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot, of, I guess in a lot of people's minds, it's kind of like, um, pastor is almost like, you know, CEO type yep. type thing. And that's it. Y- you know, yeah. So they don't know, even there's feel, no, there's no function beyond that. Yeah. They don't feel any responsibility whatsoever to like actually defend what they're doing from the Bible. So then, you know, it's just very difficult to have conversations with those kind of individuals. And, and you know, when, when it comes to like a youth pastor or something like that, that's just a word that doesn't have any meaning. Do you, do you, you see what I mean? So, yeah. so like, it's just a word that they're throwing around. And, and I mean, the same thing's happening in the SBC with all the, you know, the female pastor kind of stuff. It's just like, hey, yeah, they're not allowed to be a senior pastor, but the Bible doesn't say, say they can't be a woman's pastor. And, right. And, just, right. <laughs> <laughs> what's, and, and then what happens? So, like, you have to think about the move that just happened there. Like, the move that just happened is they invented a new category that's not in the Bible, and then they're trying to ask of the Bible to refute this category that they made up. Right. Right. So it's like, where in the Bible does it say you can't have a female pastor? Of uh, like for women, right? The Bible says like women can teach other women. So what's the problem with the woman pastor of other women? Well, the same thing. What's the po- problem with a youth pastor? Like you know, a, per- a person in your congregation, you know, intentionally shepherding the young people with a frisbee or something like that. Now, now, I mean, you can push back on like, well, how biblical is what is this pastoring action actually uh, in real life looking like, right? But then when it comes right down to it, though, the idea of a youth pastor is just, it's a foreign idea to scripture. And once you make that category, then there's no qualifications that ha- that are related to it whatsoever. And there's no rules. The Bible doesn't govern that. And that's the same thing that happens at a denominational level. Once you make a parachurch organization, then you, like, then you can just violate everything the Bible says at, you know, at the local church level because you have a parachurch organization now and this is different right and so then you just re- so basically what you do is you create new categories these categories aren't found by the scriptures and then the, in their mind the scripture doesn't say anything to these categories so you can't criticize them in any way so then when it comes to a youth pastor that's the move that that has happened so we need like there's a need like we need to have these groups like for every single demographic in our church uh, in order to minister to people, you have to surround them, like you have to segregate them and from everyone else in the body, and you have to surround them by people who are like them. And then, you know, and, and predominantly, I mean, the, you know, the impulse behind this is because, like, most, you know, parents in America are, have child centered homes, and if the kid, like, the parents think, like, if my kids like going to church, that means they're a Christian. That's what they right. think. Right. So yeah. if, if you can get my kid to like going to the church, that gives me confidence that they're a Christian. And if all you do is put them in a room with old people who are not like them, who are seriously, and, you know, they're, they're smelly and they're, you know, they're old and they're wrinkly and you know, 
No one wants, no one wants to be around that, Tim. That's creepy, right? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I, you know, are you wanting to uh, run them all away and make them hate the church? Right. So, I mean, and even, you know, cause that's how you do it. Yeah. You know, Put them around the old people. <laughs> I mean, Andy Stanley went so far as to even say that, you know, if your church doesn't have a youth ministry, then you, you hate, hate the kids at your church. And you're going to make them hate church. And I mean, he, I mean, he just he crassly says it because he knows the, the game, but I mean, well, there's a lot of things that Andy Stanley says that, you know, are <laughs> just laughable to put it, to put it gently. I can't tell who's <laughs> worse him or that Kevin M young guy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Man. I mean, they're both pretty bad. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, but the idea though, is that like, okay, like you're approaching it from a very man centered perspective and much, most of churches are very man centered. And so basically you have like individuals who are perceived as seekers and then, they're seeking God, but then you have to entertain them. You have to give them what they want in order to make them feel welcome and a part of the place. And if somehow they can feel welcome and a part of the place long enough, you know, you water down the content and you make them feel welcome long enough by giving them what they want and appealing to their fleshly desires. You give them those kind of things, that's going to make them feel connected with the place and want to stay and, it, and everything else. And so this is just a product of all that to where you have a bunch of parents who have worldly kids who they haven't discipled at all. And then they're looking to the church basically to fix them for them. Right. And then they don't really care what that looks like. So long as like the result is my kid likes the church. Right. So if my kid right. likes coming, then I can feel good about the fact that, you know, maybe spiritually they're going to be all right. Uh, and so that's, that's the only metric that matters. So then all you're doing is you're giving them a, you know, an immature adult friend quasi adult friend <laughs> uh, that will you know have the conversations with them you know theoretically that you're unable to have because you've lost all influence but with them yourself right and so right. they're gonna do the job of discipling them for you so you know but then you don't really care what that looks like as long as it looks like them my kids like the church and aren't gonna fight about wanting to go and fuss about it you know so um, so are all so are does that mean all youth pastors are disqualified shams <laughs> i mean i think the idea of a youth pastor is an absurd idea okay i think it's an absurd okay. idea uh, because it's not really in the bible now i mean all right let's let's say hey let's say let's and there are churches where you have youth pastors who take that role more seriously and they are more intentionally and seriously discipling their kids and let's say instead of uh you know in their hour long uh, youth group uh, meeting you know on wednesday night let's say that they're on the more conservative end and you know it's 45 minutes of teaching and 15 minutes of games instead of you know the 55 minutes of fun and five minutes of teaching kind of thing <laughs> or something yeah. like that i mean that's certainly that's a better situation than the other okay so so there's a spectrum of youth pastors some are like, you can imagine them anywhere along the spectrum and if you have to like you know, say, okay, we're going to have a youth pastor. I would say, well, you know, maybe hopefully it's more on the 45. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully he's more of the, you know, uh, teach for 45 minutes, play games for 15 minutes kind of yeah. youth pastor. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> That's my kind of youth pastor. Hopefully, I mean, that would obviously be better, better than the other, but then, um, but then like, but still, right. So there's, there's a foundational problem is this person a pastor, right? Yeah. Is he a pastor pastor? Like, is he qualified first Timothy three pastor? If he's not like first Timothy qualified pastor, um, like then you're playing a game that you need to stop playing. Okay. So you don't need, we don't need like youth pastors who are unqualified that we're calling pastors. This is why we have female pastors in the SBC is because we're playing this game where we're just, calling everyone a pastor, even though they're, they don't admit the, they admit the qualification. So, I mean, at the very least, call them a youth leader or something like that and save yourself some shame or something, you know, so you know, that would be a step in the right direction. But then, well, you know, to just to push back a little bit on that, I mean, isn't that what a lot of, you know, a lot of churches are trying to do like with the, <laughs> with the women pastor stuff is like, Hey, you know, Whoa, hang on. She's not a pastor. You know, she's a she's a the head organizer of women's ministry. Yep. You, yep. Know, you know, like so. It, I mean, you know, 
I'm not saying it's a good solution. I, I get you're saying that. Yeah, no, I get you're making a distinction. Hey, that's better, not necessarily best kind of thing. But, you know, that I mean, that's the same thing they're doing with the women's pastor stuff. So I'm not saying it, it's it good. seems like you're, you might be kind of opening up the door there. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to talk about, well, conceptually, how do you fix the mess that you're in? <laughs> okay. Right, right. Con- conceptually, step one would probably be to. Like make him at least teach forty five minutes. Step two would be to quit calling him a pastor <laughs> if he's not going to be a pastor, right? Uh, so yeah. step three would be okay if you're going to have the position, actually make him a pastor, qualified pastor who is actually a co elder at your church, and start- Hi- hire someone that you would be okay with teaching. Right, big church, you know, big church on right, Sunday. Right, right. So that'd be like <laughs> step three would be to hey, like why don't you actually make this dude a real pastor right <laughs> like get, yeah. get like um and not just um adult friend who is still trying to dress trendy and all that <laughs> for 20 years <laughs> <laughs> hey to be fair there there's there's some churches out there where even the head pastors you know they're trying trying, to, trying the best they're trying to dress and appeal to the younger generation yep so there's that but then i mean i think ideally what what's lost in all of this is that I mean, the God, God has appointed elders to, you know, shepherd a local body. And like, so, so what's lost in all this is that you, you do need to have elders who are viewed as elders, who are functioning as elders, who are qualified as elders, who are, you know, leading up these, um, you know, the things, the, the teaching ministries of the church. And, you know, what's, what would be even better is that if we could get out of our minds that, like the best way to minister, quote unquote, to people is to create special interest groups for a particular age demographics and, and, and just see what the Bible says about uh, one another ministry within the body. So, I mean, there's 38 one another commands in the Bible. I mean, you can just read through the New Testament and you'll see that we're instructed to admonish one another, to exhort one another, correct one another, rebuke one another, encourage one another, greet one another, welcome one another. I mean, there's just 38 one another commands that you know, those kids, like in your youth ministry, they have two adults, like, and those adults have to them. And there's a lot of blessings that come from multi generational church life. Um, you know, we, we need to get people out of this mindset that says that I come to church in order to be segregated from the people that I'm supposed to minister to. So, you know, the, Ephesians talks about God, God is appointing the church, you know, pastors to equip the saints for the works of ministry. So, we're, what we're supposed to do, like if you regain like a notion of what ministry actually is, pastors are supposed to equip the saints to for the works of ministry so that they may build one another up in love. And the way that that happens is not by segregating people out from the people that they're supposed to build one another up with and practice one another commands. The way that happens is that you have every single age in your church treating each other as if they're family, not like as if they have the plague and it's going to be too embarrassing to be in the same room with them, learning the same things that they're learning, you know, interacting with them on a regular basis. I mean, what like a biblical church is a church where every, everyone sees themselves as a mem- like a body part in this church, a member of this church that has a responsibility to care for every other body part in that church. You know, I mean, one of the things that's most encouraging to me about our church is that, I mean, you can have young kids who, we're talking to old people, you know, <laughs> before and after the service and having normal conversations. And it's not like we're a fa- like we, our church is a family. It's not just a bunch of segregated people who need their own little things in order to be OK. So. Right. So, I right. mean, that's the, that's the problem beneath the problem, you know, and, and then that points to the problem that you're talking about where, you know, if you just if you were just to, you know not call him a pastor, but he's functionally operating like one, then you're just playing a game too um, in that way. But at least you're not, you know, butchering the English language. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's a good place for us to wrap up the conversation on. And, you know, obviously, like you said, this is one of those things that's really plaguing the American church in a lot of ways. And, and I think really, really um, hindering younger generations from being able to step into faithfulness within the church, setting a really bad example for them in terms of what, you know, what the church is actually supposed to look like. uh, What are the purposes of the church and, you know, what are the actual biblical benefits and blessings that come from being a part of a local church that is intimately involved with one another um, instead of you know being segregated in all these different ways, so this is obviously a really big problem that needs to be addressed. Um, 
uh, and, and, you know, it's just, it's something that is, um, it, it just create, it, it'll create a lot of issues down the road that are much even, you know, even bigger than, than I think what we're looking at right now, if you can't invest in the younger generation overall. And luckily I think the encouraging thing though, is, you know, in terms of reformed churches, I feel like I have seen a pretty, a pretty big emphasis in general on investing in the younger generation. So that's the encouraging thing there. But then just looking at, you know, the American church in general, I don't see that as a, I don't see that as a major trend overall. So, um, you know, we, we appreciate all you guys for supporting us week in and week out, interacting with us online and, and, uh, messaging us, asking us questions, giving us topics to, uh, cover and episode and future episodes. We appreciate all that. And we encourage you guys to do that more and more. If you have questions or you have things that you want to, you want to hear us talk about, feel free to, you know, at us on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. Uh, DM, you can DM us, you can email us, leave comments uh, on the YouTube videos and ask us those questions. And, you know, uh, if it's something that we feel like we should talk about, then um, we'll be happy to make an episode about it. We appreciate all you guys who are supporting us financially, and we encourage you guys, uh, if you want to, you can support us financially through Patreon. There's a link down in the description where you can go and sign up to do that. And until the next episode, we'll see you guys. Have a good day. This has been another episode of Bible Bashed. We hope you have been encouraged and blessed through our discussion. We thank you for all your support and ask you to continue to like and subscribe to Bible Bashed and share our podcast with your friends and on social media. Please reach out to us with your questions, pushback, and potential topics for us to discuss in future episodes at BibleBashedPodcast at gmail.com and consider supporting us through Patreon. If you would like to be Bible Bashed personally, then please know that we also offer free biblical counseling, which you can take advantage of by emailing us. Now, go boldly and obey the truth in the midst of a biblically illiterate world who will be perpetually offended by your every move. Thank you.